<laughs> uh, good morning, guys. Thank you for joining us uh, this early. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's good to see at least some people after uh, last night party. Uh, my name is uh, Sergei Bezverhi. I'm a part of the Cisco Systems and uh, part of the services organization. I, uh, I am also core on the Cola Kubernetes project and a developer. Okay, um, I'm Pete. I work for Accenture and I've been involved in running OpenStack on Kubernetes for some time. Um, I built one of the, the earliest implementations that, that worked sometime before Barcelona and then got involved in this project after that. I'm also a core as well as being on Cola Kubernetes working on OpenStack Helm and the new Locky Image project. Uh, my name is Steve Wilkerson. I'm with AT&T. Uh, I got involved in the Cola project also a little after Barcelona, primarily with Cola Kubernetes, a uh, uh, core reviewer on the Cola Kubernetes project. Um, also work on OpenStack Helm, uh, so getting some, some broad experience with uh, OpenStack managed and orchestrated with Kubernetes. So I think, I think before we get into what Cola Kubernetes is and how it works, we should probably talk a little bit about what, what OpenStack is um, and what, and more importantly in some ways, what it is not. I mean, essentially, lots of the time people talk about OpenStack, they describe it as a, a cloud operating system. But I think in many ways it's more accurate to describe it as a cloud ecosystem of complementary projects that help, help each other provide all the sorts of services that you need in order to run a multi-tenant environment that allows you to provide resources on demand to your users and applications. However, what it's traditionally been very bad at is being easy to use and from being easy to deploy, scale, provide high availability for your services at, at all levels of the stack from APIs down to messaging buses and things. And it's been fundamentally very hard to upgrade and manage when you have it in production. And so there's been multiple, multiple different sort of orchestration platforms and solutions people have looked at from Ansible, um, Puppet, and other things. But over the last couple of years, Kubernetes has really, really come to the forefront um, as, a, as a way of managing processes that you have running on multiple hosts. Um, so it provides really good declarative interfaces for automating the deployment, scaling, and operations of um, containers across clusters of hosts and, and whether they're on bare metal or in virtual machines. And it allows you to deploy services quickly and easily, scale them on the fly, roll out new features on demand, and roll them back as well when um, you need to. And this complements the feature set of OpenStack because it's not currently very good at multi-tenancy operations and provides a sort of large ecosystem surrounding with block storage and other, other things that you're wanting to run. Can't, can't really run virtual machines very well and isn't, isn't capable of supporting the sort of complex uh, networking topology that a lot of people are looking for. That said, it's really worth bearing in mind that it's, it's definitely not developing slowly. So a lot of these things are starting to change with the introduction of projects like Vertlet that are bringing on um, virtual machine support and then improved CNI backends, which allow much more complex networking than was originally, originally possible. So with, with, these two, with these two sort of orchestration platforms, rather than being viewed and being competition with each other, I think you can bring them together. Um, and then start trying to treat OpenStack as just another application that runs on top of your um, infrastructure. And this, this provides several sort of benefits when you use Kubernetes as it provides a abstraction layer for your hardware that just means that you can reduce all the hard edges and start treating your, treating your infrastructure just as a pool of resources that you can push things out to. And Cola actually, when it originally started about uh, three, three years ago, I think, um, tried targeting uh, Kubernetes back then as its original orchestration mechanism. However, there wasn't, the, there wasn't the feature set in place that was required for that. So they moved to an Ansible-based deployment. And then after, after some time, uh, the features started to come into Kubernetes that allowed it to be started again, um, development started again. So, 
it was around about sort of Barcelona time last year that was the first really viable deployment of OpenStack using Cola Kubernetes, um, which relied on a customized Jinja 2 templating engine. And then at, at Barcelona, it was actually um, some people from SAP and um, AT&T as well who were really pushing the idea of using Helm as a templating engine, as, as Kubernetes own native tooling started progressing to the stage that was required to manage these sorts of complex applications. And so the, the change was made then to move Cola Kubernetes over, over to Helm, which really, I think, demonstrates one of the best things about running your infrastructure in Kubernetes is that actually the resultant manifest that you deploy out to your infrastructure, which describes how your application runs, is the important part. And while you can have many different opinions on how to build these templates and how what should go into them and how they're structured, it's, it's actually means that you can entirely change that process without changing the running of the application on your infrastructure and do quite radical changes under the hood to how you manage your applications while continuing to support customers and active workloads. Um, and also, in part of this cycle, things that we've added into Cola Kubernetes have been things like Fernet um, token rotation and management for Keystone as part of a security drive. Ironic for um, bare metal support and sort of managing the full life cycle of machines from, from loading them into your data center to getting applications up and running on them, and then eventually decommissioning and taking them out of production, and uh, Prometheus for advanced logging capabilities. Okay, cool. So I'm going to step back from the OpenStack part a little bit and actually talk about Helm. I know it's been talked about a lot the last few days. Uh, I've had people come up to me and ask if I can tell them a little more about Helm since I you know, started getting involved with Colo Kubernetes first, and then I started getting involved with OpenStack Helm. But I'm also involved in the Helm project. So uh, I come from a software engineering background, so infrastructure stuff, whenever I joined the organization I'm with now, is really new to me, but I really loved hacking away at some code. Uh, so being able to contribute to Helm has been great because it's a really cool application. It's serving a very real need, and also the community that supports it and brought it to us to start consuming is very open and welcoming. So at the end of the day, Helm is really just the Kubernetes package manager, but it's built to manage the entire life cycle of an application, which is really cool. So it's beyond just packaging up this, in our case, OpenStack, or if someone's running to run, you know, say, a web app or some other Kubernetes workload, they can bundle it up into this package, and Helm's going to handle the ability to install it, the ability to upgrade it. You can manage your releases. You can roll back a release. So it's not just a fire and forget. Helm's actually going to help you go through that entire life cycle, which if you're using it to manage something like OpenStack is pretty fantastic. Um, you don't really want to, I know me personally, I don't want to have to develop a lot of custom tooling to be able to do this. If there's a first class citizen for Kubernetes such as Helm, I think it's a, it's a great choice. Uh, another thing that Helm really helps us do, it helps us improve our CI CD workflows. So with those lifecycle hooks that Helm has, we can extend the ability to not only have individuals use Helm to install our application, OpenStack in this case, we can use software or other machines to deploy it and manage it to make sure that our applications and the changes we're making and the configurations we are pushing are actually valuable so we can make sure we're not going to have something and try to install it and break it. Um, it's, it's great having those hooks in there to help us maintain that workflow because people who are deploying OpenStack, of course, you're concerned about your CI CD pipeline. You want to make sure what you're releasing and what you're going to make available to your customers or your employees is actually functional. So this is really helpful. Um, Helm also has the ability to write plugins. So this goes back to if you want to add something custom to Helm, Instead of having to push a feature into Helm, you can develop a Helm plugin for it. And Helm actually has a fairly, it's a pretty decent sized list of plugins that are available now. Some examples of those are, you know, they're fairly simple. One of them lets you, it's just a basic plugin that you can go through and it's called Helm Nuke. You can just run it and it goes through and deletes every single Helm, Helm release that you have run. So a Helm release is going to be an actual installation of the application that you're trying to run. So instead of having to go through manually in Helm, delete, purge, 
whatever the, the release name is, you can just run Helm Nuke, and it'll go through and take care of all this for you. So in the CI CD space, if you just want a quick and dirty way to get rid of all of your releases and not have to go through manually, I know that's probably pretty bad from a CI CD perspective, but you can do that. There's another cool one, it's just Helm diff. Um, you can run Helm diff, it'll show you the differences between two releases without actually installing them, which is good. So you can also, the CI CD space or a chart developer can go through and kind of look and see what the differences would be with these. Um, Helm, at the end of the day, is also an advanced templating engine, so it's not just being able to template out values, but you can use what are called partials, which you can develop a partial template that can be used to either generate values for the Helm charts that you're developing. Um, you can use it, it's kind of like functions in a programming language, I think is a fair way to put it, so in the OpenStack, for, for OpenStack, for example, you can write a partial template for uh, handling keystone endpoints. So that's pretty neat. And uh, the service catalog and other things. And that's, so. that, that's something that we really managed to take advantage of with a lot of the um, OpenStack using, using Helm on Kubernetes projects, where we've split up different, different parts of the deployment into its own chart with associated yep. functions that allow us to template out these values. So when you're looking at an OpenStack project, Generally, they actually all follow very, very similar sort of characteristics when you're trying to install them, where you want to create a database, perform a schema upgrade on, on that database, create keystone endpoints and a service, and then an associated user. And all of these can be split out into their own sim very simple functions and jobs, which is why when it comes to instantiating a service via Helm, once the, you've got the initial framework in place, it actually becomes very easy to expand this out to other services and manage them. Right. Uh, this would be a Kubernetes manifest. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's going to be, I, full disclosure, I haven't worked with Puppet. I probably couldn't answer that. You might be able to, Sergey? No, no that's all right. Okay. Okay. So it's a template file for a Kubernetes object. Okay. Cool. Yep. And then uh, also it eliminates the numerical values in the Kubernetes manifest. Uh, this is pretty helpful because whenever you're looking at transitioning YAML to JSON and then unmarshalling it or marshalling it, um, it can present some issues. I know in past uh, there's been some issues reported on GitHub for Kubernetes where this was kind of um, causing issues for, for deployment of applications. And then also I mentioned uh, Helm with the lifecycle hooks that it has supports the ability to roll back and upgrade a, a release. So for, um, in our case, it would be an OpenStack service or another application that we want to use. So current state for Colo Kubernetes. Uh, whenever I joined, like Pete mentioned, we were still using uh, Jinja 2. So between Barcelona and now, uh, it's been about seven months, I want to say, a little shy. Right now, there are charts in Colo Kubernetes for the most common OpenStack components. So it's things like Keystone, Sender, Nova, Neutron, Glance, Horizon. Uh, it was also mentioned that we have a chart for Ironic now that can actually stand up a new compute, or compute host. Uh, we also have the other various infrastructure components. So we have RabbitMQ, Memcached, uh, MariahDB. And really, we wanted to, uh, these charts were designed with flexibility in mind. So instead of creating a, you know, a, a chart for an entire OpenStack service, it was designed to encapsulate these smaller components of the services to enable operators to have the flexibility they needed. Uh, and then also, uh, it's aiming to be a, you know, a single solution for containers, virtual machines, and bare metal. And then what's next? This is the exciting part for me. Uh, right now, if you look at where, for example, Cola Ansible is versus Cola Kubernetes today, there's about 50 plus roles in Cola Ansible. I was trying to count them the other day, but there were a lot, and I was getting distracted with the background noise, but I knew I got to 50. And right now, we've got 14 services in Cola Kubernetes, so if we're looking for parity between the two, there is some room for additional contributions, which is fantastic because is we're looking to identify new contributors for the Cola Kubernetes project, there's, there's work to do. And really, if regardless of which solution that you're looking for, 
Um, it, it's very clear that OpenStack running with Kubernetes is a hot topic. I think it was mentioned there's 48 sessions this summit just dealing with Kubernetes <coughs> and OpenStack working together. So it's, it's important for not only Cola Kubernetes, but the OpenStack community in general to get people contributing to these projects so we can kind of go through and identify common pain points or common gotchas that might arise regardless of which architecture path you're going down. And also, it's my experience with the Cola Kubernetes project is uh, it was very open and welcoming whenever I first got involved after Barcelona. I uh, volunteered for some work while I was there. As soon as I got off the plane, I actually think I wrote my first blueprint for Cola Kubernetes in the airport when I was stuck in Barcelona because of the flight delays. And uh, yeah, that's also how I met Pete. That's how I met Sergey, some of the other individuals in the community. And, it was the first time I had contributed to an OpenStack project where I really felt excited and welcomed by the people who were there. Can I mention that? Yeah. I, think, I think something else is worth bearing in mind with you know, the Cola Kubernetes is the evolution of the actual sort of deployment is, is pretty advanced, but what there's a lot of work going on at the moment is with the configuration management and mechanism by which those configuration files are produced. So, up until recently, we were sharing code with um, Cola Ansible and using it to generate configuration files that were then being converted into config maps. This, this has now been brought into the Cola Kubernetes repo so that we can start customizing this more towards that. And we're actually having conversations during, during this summit about potential future ways that we can both advance and simplify this, potentially by collaborating with other projects such as OpenStack Helm in order to try and produce a standard mechanism for making configuration and files for OpenStack components. Right. Just want to add on this topic. Uh, the goal is to try to, <clears throat> to make a generation of the configuration as a native to the Kubernetes environment as possible. So one of the goals is to uh, eliminate the dependency on Ansible in, in, in this area. And in this case, uh, any other tools like Puppet or Chef or anything else, they could use the same approach, the same uh, charts or uh, to, to generate configuration and then consume it uh, based on their workflow. And I think, I think, sorry, I don't know if any, everyone could hear that, but um, what Kevin, one of the, the major developers on this project, was saying is, you know, really one of the major things that Cola Kubernetes tries to do with its very discrete architecture that it applies to everything is not limiting an operator in what <coughs> they want to do. So whether configuration is generated by Cola Kubernetes or brought in externally, it tries to support all of those options. All right. Um... There was a, a little bit of confusion in the uh, Cola Kubernetes architecture, the way how we package uh, and we map between the microservices, services, and et cetera. And I think it would be worth to spend just a couple of minutes uh, to clarify that and maybe to explain the wider audience why we went in that direction. Uh, right after Barcelona, we had lots of uh, hot discussions on the IRC channel. And it's, the question was, to microservice or not to microservice? And uh, we found a lot of compelling reasons to go in the microservice uh, direction because it gives you the greatest level of flexibility. Um, basically, and it also maps well with the existing Cola images, where uh, the Cola images are thin images. So at the end, you have a single process running. In this case, uh, in, in, in our case, the microservice maps to the existing Cola image. Example, what we call a microservice, like example, Neutron, uh, Neutron open, open the switch agent. It is a microservice, even though it's a part of the bigger. And uh, tasks like uh, creating the database, creating the endpoints, these all are treated as a microservice, and it gives you the uh, greatest flexibility. Um, in combining this service because, I mean, 
if you deploy vanilla OpenStack, I mean, the list of tasks is fairly standard. But uh, probably not too many operators deploy vanilla OpenStack. I mean, there's, there are always some uh, corner cases which, well, I mean, for some people it is, it is a corner case, but for some people it's how it's supposed to work and they cannot function otherwise. So we try to, um, in Kula Kubernetes, we try to address more <clears throat> what, uh, what's operator wants than what, or how the developers would see it work. And I think we achieved that by going in the microservice direction. Uh, one, of the, one of the cases which we use a lot describing uh, why this architecture is um, viable and Right, as example, for the operators to optimize their network, sometimes they need to run RabbitMQ as a, stand, uh, as a separate instance just for Neutron to optimize the, the communication between the agents. Uh, in our architecture, it's fairly simple. I mean, you don't have to change the chart. You don't have to change any code. Basically, everything is done just by the configuration. And uh, so the configuration will tell the deployment uh, mechanism that, yes, Neutron will have and use its own RabbitMQ, and it's going to talk to, uh, to that instance. Everything else will use a completely separate uh, instance of RabbitMQ. Uh, when we developed microservices charts, there was like lots and lots and lots, even though uh, we, at the gate, we run um, in microservices uh, mode, if you say. But it was huge, so people were complaining, it's too complex. I agree. I mean, for the gate, it's fine, but like in the real life, you probably don't want to deploy uh, OpenStack using the microservices. So we added a next level on top of the microservice, service chart, where we consolidate uh, required microservices in the same package, and then you can deploy just Neutron, or just Cinder, or just Nova Control, Nova Compute. Um, one piece of, um, um, th th there's a key here. Uh, in Kubernetes, when you uh, send a bunch of pods to deploy, because uh, basically each microservice uh, is translated into the pod in the Kubernetes environment. So if you send uh, or tell the kubelet, um, well, I mean, we need to deploy like five pods, it will try to deploy them at the same time. And that will cause a problem because for OpenStack, I mean, you cannot deploy Neutron server before you have a, uh, you have a database created or Keystone has a endpoints and the service account created. So we, in, within the service chart, we use a piece of software, it's called EntryPoint. And EntryPoint allows us to define uh, <clears throat> certain rules and the dependencies. Example, Neutron server will not start uh, uh, unless MariaDB is up, Keystone is up, all the endpoints are created, and the user are created. Only then, after all these checks are uh, completed, only then Neutron server uh, starts and, well, basically it's ready to function. Um, well, it, we end up with a uh, uh, probably 10 service charts. And it, again, <laughs> some people complain, well, I mean, it's still too complex. We don't want to deploy 10 charts. We want to do a single, single command to deploy the whole open stack. That's where the compute kit chart um, was developed. So the compute chart used the same entry point mechanism for um, choreography, they call it, within the... Um, um, within the service charts, and so you start the compute chart, and then it deploys, it has inside service charts for all the components, and inside of the service charts, uh, you have a microservice. So it's like a, kind of a Russian doll uh, type of uh, scenario. Um, so that's how we um, answered the request on, um, for a single command to deploy the OpenStack. Uh, there's a key component is the cloud YAML. So when you, when you start, when you, when you want to deploy OpenStack, basically you need to provide certain configuration um, to Helm. 
because uh, we, we, we cannot hard code like the configuration in the chart. It, something needs to feed the current configuration to the chart before it gets started. And we use the Cloud YAML. Cloud YAML allows you to describe your specific environment, like the IP addresses, interface names, everything. Uh, like personally, I really like the Cloud YAML because it, it, it gives me a chance to have a reproducible results. So I know, like when I start a chart and I use the same Cloud YAML, like 99.99%, .99%, I'll have exactly the same results every time. So it makes things very portable. So uh, all you need, you clone Cola Kubernetes repo, you have your Cloud YAML customized, and then you're good to go to deploy um, Cola Kubernetes. Right, oh, now uh, the demo. Uh, well, uh, I, th I, think, I think Steve mentioned that uh, we see a Kola Kubernetes, uh, it's kind of a one point uh, for bare metal, VM, and the containers. Well, Kubernetes gives us the native way to run the containers. Um, OpenStack, well, we deal with the VM and bare metal. But during this demo, uh, I would like to show that uh, basically you use the same tool to expand your existing cluster. Uh, like, as, as it says, you're so successful and well, you need to expand your cluster on the fly. It can be done using the same tool you're already running on your, on your uh, cluster with the Cola Kubernetes. Um, so I have two versions. Long version, which is the live demo, it takes about 14 minutes. Most of the time, uh, it's gonna be the bare metal not going through the bias uh, <laughs> uh, boot up procedure. Uh, and I have a video as a backup, which was condensed pretty much to five minutes. Uh, I guess, I mean, we are okay. Yeah, demo would put us right at 9.40. Excellent, so. all right, so then uh, let me switch to All right, so here I have uh, my five node cluster. It was so successful, I really want to expand it with the brand new uh, UCS box I just bought. I think, I think what Sergey's highlighting here actually is how using, using Kubernetes as the deployment and management mechanism for OpenStack is you know, such a great option because it allows you to go from a single um, low availability node to expanding it out to as large or as small as you need your resultant infrastructure to be um, and becomes very adaptable as a result. Right, so as you can see, I'm already running uh, Nova on top of, oh, sorry, I, I'm already running uh, Kula Kubernetes um, on top of that uh, Kubernetes cluster and I have a bunch of compute nodes. So these are uh, like, um, compute nodes which are used to, to start the VM. And then uh, at the ID number 10, I have an ironic compute node which I'll be using to deploy a bare metal instance. Okay. So here I have a um, CMC console to my bare, bare metal server. And so let me start. So this is just a regular open stack Ironic command, which pretty much everybody use uh, to instantiate uh, Ironic instance. Very simple. Oh. All right. So it started. Uh, what I noticed working with the OpenStack and Ironic that um, it takes time before Ironic talks to Nova. So, I mean, there's a, a little bit of delay. Uh, so for the audience not to get too excited that, hey, live demo is gonna fail again. No, <laughs> it's just an expected delay. All right. Uh, in this case, um, for now, the console is still part of. So let's see what's happening with the node. Okay, so as you can see, it's in the deploying state. So that it's when the uh, ironic compute node talks to the Nova and basically 
doing their internal magic. Okay, so uh, now Ironic brought up uh, the uh, bare metal server, and I'm for, that's the longest part. So it's gonna go through the bias checks and everything before it actually starts doing that, uh, doing uh, something y interesting and useful, and I'm, it's gonna do it twice. So it's normal workflow. I mean, there is no way around that, unfortunately. Well, that's why I came up with the idea of video, but live uh, demo is always better. Now let's see. Let's check the status of. Um, uh, Nova instance. All right, so it's in the spawning state. So next, what's gonna happen after it finishes its uh, magic, uh, BIOS magic, I call it, um, it will communicate with the TFTP server, and then it will grab the image which uh, was placed in the glance. And that image has already uh, baked uh, Kubernetes binaries. And as a part of the command uh, I use to spawn that uh, uh, bare metal instance, I'm passing the script uh, which would be executed by um, cloud init infrastructure. In this case, when the node comes up with the image, it will automatically join the existing cluster it will become a new Kuber, like a real native Kubernetes node. And then after it's completed, it will also become a Nova, new Nova compute node where you can, and you can use it basically to run other virtual machines or something else. So uh, yeah. I guess at this point, yeah, now it, um, it's gonna get the IP address, image, and will contact the ironic conductor for um, yeah for the image. Uh, the interesting thing that we discovered is that it basically it uses the iSCSI interface to mount the image and do the copy. So it uh, takes the disk space available on bare metal node, and then it just do DD from. Uh, from the glance image to that disk, and that's pretty much it. So it's, uh, yeah, there are gonna be a few seconds here while it's copying the image. As soon as it's done, that it's gonna be another power cycle, and it should change the state of a uh, node in Ironic, and then it should show that the in Nova list that the inst bare metal instance is active. at basically the time when it does a uh, copying of that, um, I don't recall what was the size of the image, but uh, it's, it's a basically it's a CentOS-based image with the binaries. Okay. Oops. All right, so, yeah. yeah, all right, so it completed the uh, copy and then final reboot before that the real operating system will come up on this node. Yeah, let's see what's going on here. Okay, so from the ironic perspective, at this point, the deployment is completed. Uh, the power state is on and the provisioning state is active. Now let's see what Nova thinks about that. Yeah, okay, so the um, Nova also sees that the bare metal instance is active in the running state. Now we can switch. Um, yeah, uh, I'd like to basically demonstrate some sort of a dynamic of adding this node into the Kubernetes cluster. And for that, uh, I use highly recommended by uh, one of our team members, watch command. Hopefully I typed fast enough. Yeah, okay, so it's not there yet. 
All right, and then I'm switching back to uh, CMC console. Oh yeah, plenty of time. As I said, servers, they don't come up as fast as we would like. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. But I mean, you have more CPU or more horsepower <laughs> behind that. All right, so one more time. I'm positive it's a marketing trick. I guess uh, uh, my coworkers at Cisco decided, okay, let's show the Cisco logo twice. <laughs> All right, so now it's going to bring up um, the operating system, which is uh, Linux, and then it's going to go through um, adding this node to the cluster. And then there's a kind of a not very lengthy, but um, um, considerably visible uh, step when uh, there is a synchronization of the Kubernetes states. So the existing API server pushes a bunch of um, um, let's say file system, like virtual file systems for the existing or already running um, uh, Kubernetes ports. Because when it joins, um, things like the kubelet and the proxy will start running on, on, the, um, on the newly uh, brought up the compute node. So around this time, we should see a new, yeah. All right, so this is the new uh, compute node. It appeared in the uh, kubectl node list command. As you can see, it's in the not ready state, because th and that's exactly what it's doing now. So it's synchronizing uh, state between the existing cluster and the newly, uh, new node. Uh, normally, it takes about 30 seconds to get into the ready state. Okay, I guess this time by some reason it takes longer, but uh, yeah, okay, all right. So we are in the ready state now. We can get out of here and then use another command. Again, uh, uh, well, we use, in Kola Kubernetes, we use a lot Kubernetes labeling. And labeling allows you to direct or steer certain um, ports to run or not to run on the specific, specific node. And I'll talk more about that just in a second. Get ports. Um, all right. Yep. Oops. Oh, no, sorry. Minus V. Okay, so as you can see, we have uh, several uh, ports which are in the init state. And the reason is that uh, all these microservices are um, demon, uh, demon sets. So wh what happens is that when we label the node to be Kola compute node, uh, Kubernetes knows which set of ports needs to be automatically pushed in that direction. I, I think it's a beauty of the Kubernetes. Basically, without any uh, manual operation, you can, uh, you can deploy certain services on your new, uh, new compute node. That's what gives a great flexibility. Um, and I think it's a great advantage that uh, Kubernetes brings to the uh, OpenStack environment. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, this process uh, might take b so somewhere between three and four minutes, depending on the <laughs> how busy the internet link is, because all these images get pulled from the Docker Hub. Hopefully, uh, not too many people are using internet at this hour. So, <laughs> <laughs> I think 
I think it's also worth mentioning, because this is a great example of how Kubernetes has evolved over the last year or so with things like in its containers that are running and being processed through at the moment. We have one here. This is checking the environment, so it is seeing if there's communications with the database, the message bus, and other things. And then we have other ones that are preparing certain aspects of the host's file system before letting the primary pod launch. Which is, which is both cleaner and also allows us to do sort of very, very basic ordering of how a service should come up um, you know, at, a, at a micro level. Right. And uh, like before, the boot up time for a Kubernetes cluster the, without the init container was significantly longer because they crash every time when the computer, oh, sorry, when the port crashes, then next time it restarts with the exponential delay. So if it crashes too many times, I mean, you might have to wait five, 10 minutes before it gets retried. OK, all right, so that should be pretty much done. Uh, now, ironic, node list. OK, so it's active. Oh, oops. Yeah. I like Kublet. <laughs> oh, get notes. Yeah, you know, mixture between the open stack and the, <laughs> and the uh, Kubernetes, you know, makes you to type weird commands. So I was thinking about Cinder list. Anyway, as you can see, now we have a new new node here, and then Nova service list. Yeah, as you can see, we have another uh, compute resource here, which is uh, in the up state, and basically it's ready to start serving or start um, st uh, being used for uh, VM U1 spawn on it. All right, that's pretty much complete. Thank you. I think it's you. No, no, that's it. You're on a. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> what did we have left? So I think, um, and obvious, obviously, any if you have any questions now, just feel free. There is also a Cola onboarding session running down downstairs. Um, it would be great if, if you wanted to go to after this, which would tell you um, how you can start getting involved in this project. Um, as we touched on earlier, there's obviously lots of things that are, are going on with currently a big emphasis on sort of how we start to configure these services in a viable fashion moving forward as we move away from Ansible-based configuration by default and, and enable people to do whatever weird and wonderful things they want to do with their own clouds. The onboarding room is 105. Okay, so that's, that's room 105 downstairs. Uh, no, it's uh, basically it's a built image. I was using disk image tool that usually uh, ironic people suggest, um, and uh, just with the slight modifications of adding the uh, Kubernetes RPMs. So, because I mean, we need the, the, those binaries to to join cluster. Yes. Yeah, uh, Kola Kubernetes doesn't install Kubernetes cluster. Right. So if you have a cluster, exactly, yes. Yep. So I mean, both both me and Steve work work on both projects and. 
I think this is what I was touch, touching on earlier in the way that actually the, the resultant manifest that is output both by Cola Kubernetes and OpenStack Helm is in many ways very, very similar. We, we do things like Fernet um, token rotation quite differently, which is something that um, actually Intel have been work, working on very recently with us on OpenStack Helm. And we manage configuration very differently at the moment. Um, but I'd say the, the biggest sort of difference between the projects is, is that Cola Kubernetes provides almost what I think of sort of cloud Lego in the sense that we provide very low level components that can be built up into a, a larger structure using Helm's dependency modeling, which works, works very well for, for some deployers. But for other people, we're looking to obtain a, a manifest which in, describes the service in its entirety. Um, which makes it potentially, for many use cases, a bit easier to manage, orchestrate, and, and upgrade, because you can do a service in, it, in its entirety rather than as discrete steps. However, the work um, Cola Kubernetes has been doing recently on producing service level charts just provides a, a rather different approach to achieving, at the end of the day, a very similar end result of OpenStack on Kubernetes. So, you know, I don't, I don't really see a sort of conflict between them because we are coming from such different angles with both, both projects in respect to how these charts are manufactured and built. Okay, so how does Cola compare to Lobby? Well, that's, 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 a, that's a tricky question. Um, I mean, and sort of in many ways, kind of slightly touches back on, on this point in that Cola views the image as um, being the sort of oracle of truth in terms of how the service should be run. So it has a rather prescriptive entry point script which determines where configuration files go, the entry commands that's run. Whereas with um, Locky, we view that just as a, a sort of bucket and repository for code and leave it up to the orchestrator to decide how that's managed, how the container itself starts up and where configuration is within that. Um, so it's a much, we try and view that as being a much lighter weight project than, say, Cola. Yeah. So it's a difference in philosophy. So, like you said, the, the low key is about just putting binaries in a container and shipping it. And Cola's containers are more of a, we need an API to I think, I think actually what's, what's quite interesting is both of, both of these questions are very related in some ways in that um, I think with Locky, would it be, well, Sam, the, the other guy, well, the PTL of Locky, I think, um, would it be fair to say that it is the, we provide building blocks for, <laughs> for um, services and whereas with Cola Kubernetes, the chart is viewed as the, the building block. I guess we're done. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks.